Thank you for tuning in to the best parenting show on the internet. Post Daily Dose. Hey guys, <laughs> Christy Saul, the co-founder of the Post Institute with the Take Two, um, because, well, my battery died. I lost battery. <laughs> so it's a, a little ironic. It's kind of, I feel kind of bad making a joke about something that's so serious, but, um, you know, that's a coping mechanism, right? So um, I'm bringing out the book, From Fear to Love. You know, we've been working on that book study, and I was rolling, man. I was just getting ready to be into the heart of my message, and my phone died. So, um, I hope you guys uh, come back and join me. Mimi, I see you there, so thank you. Thanks for making it back. I hope that Lydia makes it back, and the other folks, Aaron, and I know there were a couple of people commenting, and so I hope that you guys uh, come back and rejoin um, the conversation um, so it's uh, John Bowlby, who is the father of attachment, he's quoted as saying, the threat of loss is equal to loss itself. Um, and this message really is being called out um, from a Facebook uh, instant message that I received asking us to, um, to speak to our frontline families. And um, so when I think about, well... When I think about that phrase, the threat of loss is as real as loss itself, and I allow it to really saturate my heart and to think about um, many of us have experienced loss. We've experienced um, death of loved ones. We've experienced divorce. Uh, we may have experienced loss of our own children. And then when I think about our children and I think about... Um, you know, regardless of the circumstance of being in foster care or being adopted, um, it's still a significant loss, a loss of their family. And so then when we layer that on to the national health crisis, to the pandemic, and you think about um, the, the things that they're missing, the things that they feel like they're losing, losing contact with their peers, with their teachers. And for many kids, those are really safe, loving relationships. And the knowing that in some cities, um, frontline workers, especially healthcare workers, are being quarantined away from their families. So they're having to um, stay at the hospital or in housing provided that's controlled. And that's because they want to make sure that the people who are keeping um, in the community well and providing safety for the community's health, that they are not um, accidentally getting exposed. And so think about that. My goodness, um, if you are a parent of a child, a foster child or an adopted child, a child who's already, already experienced significant loss, and now um, a parent is not able to stay home because they're quarantined, the threat of loss is as real as loss itself. That's very hard for those babies to understand, no matter the age, even a grown-up baby, <laughs> even a grown person, you know, the baby inside of us is going to feel that loss or the threat of that loss. They're going to feel that separation, and it's super significant for us to just no matter where, what community we're in, we're all experiencing the pandemic differently. Like um, I was saying here in Oklahoma, we're actually going to be opening up certain parts of business that had been closed effective May 1st with all these guidelines and, um, you know, hopefully it'll go well. Hopefully it will go well and hopefully it will be part of a process that helps the world open up and be safe. I hope it goes like that, but I, for one, won't be participating in that because I've got loved ones that I need to make sure and protect uh, people who are in risk categories. And so we're, we're all in our own little bubbles, you know, in our, the bubbles of our community, and we don't necessarily 
have full comprehension or full understanding of how um, large cities, how things are being, you know, where people l naturally live on top of each other, live closer to, talk about Boston, Massachusetts, you know, LA, New York City, Michigan, Dallas, Atlanta, these big metropolitan areas, Denver, where people literally live right on top of each other. And so the pandemic has a very different effect in places like that than it does in a state that's much more rural like Oklahoma. So the other thing to think about too is when we say frontline workers and we're talking, you know, we're thinking about medical professionals, but really frontline workers at this point are anybody who's still employed. Anyone who's still out there actively going to work every day is a frontline worker. So whether you're your loved one is working at a grocery store or working at a drive through where people come through and get their groceries or whether they're working at a drug store providing life and death medications to people who might be super stressed out or whether they're at a nursing home as an employee or whether they're at a hospital as a surgeon. So the, um, the title that a person holds that um, qualifies them as being a frontline worker, the trash people, you know, think about it. Think about all the people it, that are frontline workers that keep our, that are keeping our world going. And then think about those families. Think about their families at home. And uh, think about what it feels like every time they walk out the door and they're hoping that they're safe. And every time that they come home and they strip their clothes at the, at the back door or drop them in the laundry, they go straight to the shower before they get to hug and kiss anyone in their family. And how um, parents are being asked to comfort and soothe their children. Um, imagine a foster child or an adopted child who's already had so much loss. And now a parent is trying to help them understand why mom or dad isn't home or why to wait till uh, they get cleaned up before we give those hugs and kisses. Oh, it's very complex. It's very complex and it's very real. The threat of loss is as real as loss itself. The things we are concerned about, everything we're going through in our worry and our concern, our children are going through it too. And to just expand the compassion for that. And so it, as I say that, um, you know, how, how each family deals with stress is different. You know, for some families, staying busy and staying occupied is a really great strategy. And so, you know, um, the crisis learning programs may be a, a blessing to your family where it's keeping you occupied. And so the feeling of the feelings of fear and anxiety, it's providing you a sense of normalcy and providing a sense of routine, in which case that's awesome. On the other hand, for some families, those are things that are just adding more stress to a situation that's already really charged emotionally. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, there's no better time than to really focus on what it is your family really needs. And us as a community embracing families, especially the families who have frontline workers and and family members who are in the high risk categories to just really extend it, our hearts of compassion. Um, check in on those people, ask them, how are you really doing? Be open to having vulnerable conversations. You know, one thing that I have noticed is through this time, um, wounds that had not previously been revealed because of our busyness are being revealed. And so for us to be the mature uh, adults, the mature figures in our family, to be open to deep emotional expression and for us with one another as adults to, um, to be vulnerable. You know, today I had a, a friend of mine FaceTime me. Um, she's thinking about starting a business and we spent, actually we spent like an hour together just talking and we talked about some deep, raw, vulnerable wounds because she's wanting to pour into um, a population of people who have just really, really been deeply wounded. And so 
we talked about our own experiences in that journey of our identity and our growth and our maturation and our and our flesh and and just really poured into each other and so I just you know um it's there's a beautiful opportunity in weakness to allow other people to help hold us up and so um you know, I just really hope, I hope that the families of the frontline line workers out there, whatever the position is, that there are people um, that you are able to go to with your strong emotions, with your raw, vulnerable self, with your transparency, with your frightened heart, that you can go and have people that pour into you and love on you and help provide comfort and reassurance um, and uh, give you what you're needing so that you can pour those things into your children because um you know this isn't necessarily the time to, that we can just you know take lemons and turn it into lemonades every minute you know there there are moments of great joy i hear i'm hearing beautiful stories of people um looking at ways that they want to be able to continue to work from home so that they can be with their families because they're finding such value in this family togetherness time. And that is a beautiful thing. And there are also families who, whose loved ones are going out every single day and every single day there is experiencing this fear, the fear of loss that's as real as loss itself. So I think my message today really is just to bring that to the awareness to um for us as adults to reach out to one another and that and offer and be vulnerable you know to to let to let somebody know that when you're struggling and if you have friends who are frontline workers to reach out to them ask them how they're doing offer some FaceTime offer some love time offer just that you know I'm a place I can hold space for those feelings I'm here with you um, we don't have to be allergic to the emotions that come up because they are real. They are real and they are raw. And the fear of loss is as real as loss itself. When we can support those parents, then they're going to be more able to support their children. And in supporting their children, that's, you know, that's talking about some tough truths that, yes, this is real and, yes, your dad, your mom, whoever it is that's out there, your sister, your brother, your cousin, your uncle who's out there every day, they are doing their best to keep themselves safe. They love you no matter where they're at. Keep in phone contact. Use that FaceTime, you know. Um, I find myself worried, you know, after watching the national news. You know, here in Oklahoma, it's quiet. But when I look at that national news and I see, um, I see car lines that are miles long for people waiting to get uh, bags of food, and I hear the stories of college students who are in a gap where they can't get assistance, like food stamps and SNAP, um, and because they're living with their parents or because they're not working 20 hours a week or whatever whatever governmental rules were in place that made sense during a different time and those rules haven't been adjusted and so we have people falling through the cracks um, who who really are in, in very difficult situations for basic needs to be met. Um, when I hear about um, you know some people receiving um, assistance in terms of the stimulus check, people not getting it and People who are unemployment getting a $600 a week or a month or whatever raise and people who are out there still working, 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 not getting raises and not getting bonuses and yet they're the ones who are really keeping this thing going, you know, um, the tensions can get really tight. And then when tensions get tight and stress gets tight and fear takes over, then our best of humanity does not show. When we start fighting against one another, we start perceiving these fears and we start um, feeling as if there is a lack versus that there's plenty and believing in the greater good. And so um, I guess that's the other piece is, you know, um, someone in Dallas 
may be feeling the pressure of this, the stress of this way different than me in Oklahoma. And so those of us who might be, who are living in places that are not hot spots, we have, we have a privilege and we have an opportunity. And that opportunity is to carry, to carry those people, to carry those people in our prayers, to carry those people in our generosity, to carry those people in our hearts. And so as I say that, it just, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe that's even another piece for the the families of frontline workers whose children are feeling concerned, you know, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes doing something for somebody else or having somebody do something for you is uh, something that just helps us feel more connected. Um, so as I say that, what I'm picturing is, um, you know, maybe I just need to find a pen pal or 10 in those communities and Marley and I will send letters and cards and you could do the same thing. You could get on your Facebook page and you could say, hey, you know what? In my community, things are pretty chill. We're doing okay here. So is there anybody out there that needs help? Is there anybody out there who needs prayer? Is there anybody out there who needs a friend to talk to about all this? Because that's going to be what gets us through this, you know, um, in listening to them talk about financial forecasts on the national news and hearing that, you know, a lot of lenders are giving like a, an automatic 90 day grace, but there's up to 12 months and that can be tacked on the end of your loan. And then hearing to be prepared for fallout, financial fallout, economic fallout for the next year to two years. I can't help but think about um, Kit Kittredge from the American Girl Stories and learning about the impact of the Great Depression and the years that followed that and how families pulled together, you know, they rented a room out to somebody, they grew their garden and they shared and together as a community to get through those really tough times. We actually have blueprints as a country for how to get through difficult times and greed has nothing to do with it. There's no place for that. Um, everything has to be about um, looking out for our fellow man. Uh, so, I think I've soapboxed enough. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you frontline workers. And thank you for the families of those frontline workers. I feel like everybody in that family nucleus is is serving our country, um, serving in a way to help us all be, um, to be well. Um, I pray that, um, that greed and short-sightedness sightedness does not, um, doesn't doesn't get in our way that we're able to sidestep those temptations and that we can continue to step in love and that we can support those families so that they can take care of their babies you know so we're going to bring it all the way back around the only way the only way I know to help those families be healthy is to pour into those parents and we can pour into those parents so that they can do their job of being good mamas and good daddies and then that that's the best that we can offer to help create family cohesion and keep the families of our frontline workers safe and intact and feeling loved and so um, with that I'll be interested if anybody comes up with anything really cool and creative that they do to support their friends or to support families in another state, uh, maybe families they don't even know. I'd absolutely love to hear about that. Um, much love to you guys. My heart's just really full tonight and uh, I hope there's something in this message that you take and uh, plant a seed. Plant a seed of something good and watch it grow. Much love to you guys.